Well, I tell you, if the uh, fourth member of that quartet would have been up there, it would have been great, wouldn't it? It was wonderful. Appreciate it very much. I would like to report. I'd like to catch the guy that stole my brand new Cadillac. I'd like to see it. I'm not going to get what Mordecai Ham got, I guess. Either that or you weren't listening to Brother Ellis earlier. I know there's a lot of opening remarks that are appropriate. I don't have time to do that. I'm under a little uh, bit of a schedule, and I want to uh, maintain my part of what I was instructed to do by the boss. So I want you to look in your book, if you would, to the 32nd chapter of the book of Genesis. And while you're turning there, I read a little piece, a paragraph from the lips of A.W. Tozer. The title of this is Preach to Make Them Sweat. He said, I preach to my congregation week after week, and I pray that they may be able, that I may be able to preach with such convicting power that my people will sweat. I do, want, I do not want them to leave my services feeling good. Doesn't sound like a modern day preacher, does it? The last thing I want to do is to give them some kind of religious tranquilizer and let them go to hell in their relaxation. So I'm not going to try to make you sweat tonight, but I hope you'll think seriously about what I feel like the Lord would have me talk to you about from the book of Genesis chapter number 32. Genesis chapter 32, and we'll begin our reading in verse number 22. Genesis 32 and 22. And he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his eleven sons and passed over the ford Jabbok. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of he touched his, the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, "Let me go, for the day breaketh." And he said, "I will not let thee go except thou bless me." And he said unto them, "What is thy name?" And he said, "Jacob." And he said, "Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince Hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed? And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen God face to face. My life is preserved. And as he passed over Peniel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. Therefore the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day, because he, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew, it shrank. I want to talk to you tonight about Jacob, Jabbok, and you. And I'm going to put my watch in front of me because I want to obey the boss. No, I'm not talking about the Lord either. I'm going to talk about the boss of ROA. Jacob gathers his family and his friends, and he fords the river Jabbok. He has just left a confrontation with his father-in-law, Laban. Now he faces his estranged brother, Esau. He is facing his family, his brother, who is accompanied by 400 armed men. Merry Christmas. This does not look like it's going to be a lot of fun. I think sometimes our, our companions, our churches, our activities, our busyness keeps us 
from finding God. The fear of man bringeth a snare. I think our work for God can sometimes become an elaborate ploy to avoid God dealing with us. In the crowd, we compare ourselves with others, and from our perspective, we look pretty good. We condemn the sins that we don't commit and covered and cover with multitudinous excuses the ones that we have a propensity for, and they are 10 times worse than the ones that others commit. We must get more interested in God than our work for God. I think our accomplishments sometimes, oftentimes, breed pride. One of the dumbest questions that is ever asked an evangelist, and I, I'll be conservative, I've heard it 14 million times. And they ask and say, are you keeping busy? What a dumb question to ask. If you tell them what you're doing, they think you're bragging. If they tell you you're not having any meetings, they think you're out of business. The most interesting question I ever got from a preacher in my life, my dad used to have every year, David Otis Fuller come and preach all day on a Sunday when he was an elderly, elderly man. I think he came eight or 10 times over the years. And uh, eloquent speaker, tremendous, tremendous preaching voice. He drank vinegar uh, in water, diluted in water. He drank that all the time that he preached. And I don't know if that gave him his great voice, but I'd just rather have the lousy one that I have than do that. <laughs> but we went out to eat. Uh, I think it was a big boy restaurant. And he asked me this question. He said, Brother Tim, would you tell me of the most interesting conversion you've had lately in your ministry? Thanks be to God, I had been preaching in northern Florida, little church, wonderful preacher. I preached there every year, I think, for 40 years up until last year, maybe even 42 years every year I was there. Last year we didn't have it, and we didn't have a meeting this year either. And uh, they had asked me while I was there, uh, if an old folks home came over to the church, if I would preach to the old folks home. And so I said, yes, I will. Within a few hours or so, a precious friend of mine who had a large Bible college in the area, he asked me to come and speak at chapel on the exact same day that I had already committed to preach to the old folks' home. I said, I'm sorry, I can't come. I have a previous commitment. He said, what is it? I said, I'm preaching. They're bringing a bunch of old codgers over, and I'm going to preach to them. He said, I'd really like to have you come. I said, I can't. I made a commitment. And so the old codgers came. I don't think they understood a word I said. They may have understood it, but I don't think they heard it. There were only about a dozen of them. Standing in the back was the lady that had brought them. She was a Jewish lady. After the service, she came to me. She said, I heard what you said today about Jesus Christ. You preach. She said, I'd like to become a Christian. It's the only Jewish person I have ever won to Christ in all of my 51 years of preaching. But I was glad to be able to report to Dr. Fuller that story that I just related to you. I want to get on with my message. Or I'll, I forgot what time I started. Brother Ellis, tell me, I don't want to mess up. Look at verse number 24. He was left alone. 
left alone. Not a place of self-sufficiency. Now I want to say this, that God can do very little with the self-sufficient Christian. When you feel like you have arrived, you probably haven't even gotten on the boat. Many, I think, mistake the shores of their experience for the vast ocean of God's salvation. God's love and forgiveness are our first experience with him. And sad to say, that is all the farther that most people go. They never arrive at his holiness, his justice, his equity, his righteousness, all of those are shunned because they all mean death to everything else in life that is not divine. We are, and I said it this morning, partakers of his divine nature. So ultimately, we must die to our human nature. He's alone. There's a choice that must be made between God and self. There's another little word there that's interesting to me in verse number 24. And there, there, there must be a there for you. There must be a there. There must be the city of there where God deals with your heart. And the Bible said in verse 29 that he blessed him there. You know this as well as I do. The question comes down to whether or not God reigns or you, or you reign. God sits on the throne of your heart. You have abdicated and you let him have control of your life. You see, we live in a day, if God doesn't change you, you will change God. And you will make him kind of like a lovey-dovey old gentleman that pats us on the back and tells us how good we are. I'm not a pastor. I've never been a pastor. I have no intention of ever being a pastor. If God calls me a pastor to be a pastor, I'm going to retire. I think sometimes people get, preachers get to the place where they love people more than they love God. When that happens, it breeds compromise and accommodation. His principles must rule in our lives. So you know the story. Silently through the night, there's a wrestling match. Double leg takedown, single leg takedown. There's reversals, but they never get off the mat. And the morning dawns, in verse number 26, God, you know, God seemingly, I think God, he has a great store of crises. And those crises are some of the best things that happen in our lives. We don't like them from a human standpoint, but they are necessary to us spiritually. And so God hurts him. I heard Dr. Rice preach a lot of times when I was a young preacher. I heard him say one time that God cannot greatly use a man until he greatly hurts that man. I heard a story the other day. You know, when those stories pop in your head, you got to tell them or they're just going to mess you up for the rest of the message. I heard a story about a fellow who had preached a sermon, pastor, thought he'd done a pretty good job. He's riding home in the car with his wife. He's kind of hinting that he might get a, you know, a little a nudge or a little positive comment from her. And he said, you know, finally he said, you know, honey, there really aren't that many great preachers left in America. 
She hardly paused a beat and she said, I believe that's true. And there's one less than you think there is. You know, there are some people, some Christians that never have to be struggled with. They seem to acquiesce immediately to the will of God. And then there's others that have to be crippled. God has to deal with them, not in necessarily a harsh way, but a lovingly disciplined way. Dr. DeBakey was the first man to do a human heart transplant. Houston, Texas. He had a great student by, a student by the name of Gene Burroughs. Gene had gone to medical school, trained under DeBakey. DeBakey told Gene one day after his medical schooling was done, he said, Gene, if you'll stay with me, I will make you the greatest heart surgeon in the world. Gene Burroughs said to him, he said, Dr. DeBakey, I can't. I was a 16-year-old boy in a church service, and the Holy Ghost of God called me to the mission field of India, and that's what I'm going to do with my life. And he did. He, he didn't have to get in a car wreck. He didn't have to have some terrible disease, a 16-year-old boy obeyed the call of the Holy Ghost in his life. nursery and somehow that little girl had gotten her head up in that scroll work and hung herself to death I've heard Dr. Loheed tell it I've heard my dad tell it 50 times they made an altar of that bed with their dead daughter there and he went off to Bible college at J. Frank Norris's and came back to Michigan and built a tremendous work for God I would rather go quietly than have to go that way. Because of your attitude, your personality, your lack of character. Sometimes God has to do things to you so that you would recognize he does them for you. You see, if God wins this wrestling match, the winner wins and the loser wins. If you win your wrestling matches with God, you lose. Victory comes when we submit. When Jacob admitted to his name, you know the story, I'm not gonna go back and look at it. He admitted to his name, he admitted to his nature. Come to the fact that you are what you really are, admitting that he stole the birthright, admitting the kind of guy that he was. He answered the question, he said, my name is Jacob. He means crook or thief or unethical. Sounds like a lot of preachers in America today. God help us. 
his commitment to be consecrated. He said, I have ceased to be my old self and I will become what God wants me to be. I don't think God is interested in the consecration of your talents, but the presentation of your body as a living sacrifice. In verse 30, and it says there that he saw God face to face. And then, you know, the Bible scholars jump in with Exodus 33 and 20, there shall no man see me and live. Now, there's two ways to look at that. He said he saw God, but he'd been a liar until three verses ago. So why believe him now? Or you could look at it, he did die. He died such a death to self and to sin that God had to rename him and Jacob became Israel. Holiness becomes transformed morality. I would to God that his people would measure their growth by their sensibility to sin. We quote the verse, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, my people will humble themselves and pray. Turn, turn. You can't even turn the television off. How can you turn from your wicked way? God help us. In verse 31, he hurts, he limps, he's crippled. I say this evening, the man of God is not the mightiest or the most muscled or the one with the loudest voice or the leather lungs, but the man of weakness and of no strength in himself and the one whose might is all wrapped up in God. It's total dependence upon him. It's reliance upon him. There were two kinds of faith that impressed our Lord, great and little. The only person he really said a negative thing to was the disciples. One time he said to them, you have no faith, none whatsoever. I submit to you tonight this thought that a limping Israel can outrun a healthy Jacob spiritually any day of the week. When one has seen God face to face and been touched and transformed, you won't, listen, you're not gonna run off at some tangent. Like the, one of the brothers talked this morning, you're not gonna get wrapped up in the mid-trib tribulation. There, there's, a, there's a bunch, they think we're in the tribulation period right now. You think I'm kidding, don't you? They think we're in it right now. They think we've been in it since Jesus rose from the grave. A 2,000 plus year, it has been a little tribulating, if that's a word, since the last election, I'll give them that. Oh, we're not supposed to talk about that stuff, I forgot. You're not gonna run off and get sidetracked by some foolishness. I'm gonna make it, doctor. I was preaching in that little church I was telling you about in Florida, maybe seven, eight years ago now. And uh, there was a wonderful lady in that church. She's gone to be with the Lord now, just precious dear. And we would always go over to her house one uh, day during the week long meeting that we'd have. Her husband raised quail and we would, I would go over there and put a lot of quail away. You know, they're not very big. You, and we just eat the breast, and but I tell you, it's just, it's just delicious. And uh, she had a brother, and from what I tell you in the next five minutes, uh, you'll know a little bit more about him. He went to another church. He would always come to the revival one night. That was it. He was uh, cantankerous. He was a curmudgeon. He was just an old coot. Hard to get along with, 
unkind, really, to a lot of people in the small community, and everybody knew him. One day they, they had something during the revival meeting. I, I, honest, I'm going to confess something. I hate preachers' fellowships. I hate going to the dumb things. Because some guy will get up, he hasn't prayed, he hasn't studied, and the guy calls on him, well, all I got is what I taught in Sunday school last Sunday. And give me. Come on, man. I stay at the hotel. Not interested in that junk. And so I think they'd had three speakers. I might have started at 10, and it's only about 1130. And the meal's not ready, and the ladies are all, you know, the, so the pastor, he doesn't know what to do, and so he opens it up for testimonies. Well, this old codger was there. And I, I, I sat way in the back, and, you know, when they looked around for preachers, I ducked down, I spilled my bubble gum or, you know, knocked a song, but I didn't want to get up and preach. Those things, they're dead at 4 o'clock in the afternoon or 4 o'clock in the morning. I don't care, they're dead. And uh, a couple of preachers said something, and he stood up. The pastor told me later, he said when he stood up, his name was Brother, Brother Bloodsworth. He said, when Brother Bloodsworth stood up, he said, my heart sank. Now, I noticed when Brother, when the old man stood up, he was on crutches. And he had a brace on one of his legs from the hip down to his ankle. And he spoke. And this is basically what he said. He said, I was riding my tractor, doing some bush hogging, had the bush hogger on the back. And he said, I went under a tree and a vine caught me in the neck and pulled me off my tractor into my bush hog. This man's 75, maybe 78 years old. Old man, like me almost. And he said, I was in that bush hog, my knee was caught. He said, I couldn't get out, the tractor's still going. He said, I knew I was gonna die. He said, I pulled my knee, I pulled it out of there. I got it out. When I did, I uh, dislocated my knee. I pulled all the ligaments except those in the back of my knee. He said, I laid there, I couldn't walk, I couldn't get up. And I watched my tractor turn and come around, and come right for me. He said, I knew I was a goner. He said, I cried out to God, help me, Lord. He said, that tractor got within 30 feet of me and turned and went up against the tree and just stood there and ran and ran and ran and ran and ran and ran and ran. He said, night fell. He said, my wife was handicapped. She got worried. She knew something was wrong. I hadn't come into the house. She called 911 and people came. Long story short, off to the hospital he went. He said, I was there 90 days in the hospital. And this is what he said. That bed, that hospital bed became my green pastures. Those lonely nights, my still waters, and God restored my soul. And I saw that man probably for the next five years of his life. He was a completely different man. The old curmudgeon had dissipated, and the cordial child of God had come to life. The man with a frown on his face was a constant smile of God's grace. Sometimes, I, I don't know, that 10th verse, we didn't read it, but I tell you, it sure describes a lot in my life. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies. All the mercies that God has sent my way, all the blessings that I've received from his hand. 
I don't know how hard it must have been for God to kill. There in the garden for the first time, he was life. God is life. He's eternal life. Whom to know, if you know him, is life and that more abundant. But he took that lamb's life in the garden to clothe beloved man, Adam and Eve, saw out of character, in my opinion, for God to kill. And then on Calvary, his precious lamb died to clothe mankind in the harmony of his grace. I don't know how God deals with you, but I know how God deals with me. And I'd rather be dealt kindly with than harshly. I'd rather see his smile than the frown on his face. I'd rather experience his grace than his judgment, his mercy than his strong hand. May God help us tonight to let God do in our lives what he would have us to do.